of men. Romantic love can be reconceptualized as a cluster of superstimuli, with each facet driving the human nervous system into overexcitement. That excitement tends to negatively impact on men's long-term welfare. The damage is not contained there. Our social and familial world is disintegrating rapidly under the excesses and toxicity of romantic love. In a way, romantic love has become one of the most anti-human exploitations of human biology to ever darken our species. To understand where this originated, we need to take a brief look at the history of romantic love, previously called courtly love, to show that the same elements were already at work in its inception. As laid out in great detail by medieval forebears, the literature reveals the same exaggerated neoteny, enhancements of sexuality, and the same obsession surrounding control of romantic attachment. While the neoteny ploy has been in operation at least since ancient Egypt in the form of colored eyeshadow and eyeliners, the practice gained greater popularity after the Crusaders found eyelid coloring cosmetics used in the Middle East and who spread the practice throughout Europe. By the Middle Ages, European aristocrats were widely using cosmetics, with France and Italy becoming the chief centers of cosmetics manufacturing including the use of stimulant compounds like belladonna, which is an Italian name meaning beautiful woman. Belladonna was used to make the eyes appear larger. Thus neoteny, manufactured by artisan techniques, became the cultural inheritance of each successive generation of girls who were, and still are, taught the art of applying and then displaying makeup especially to the eyes. Such practices probably encouraged praises of women's eyes in troubadour poetry, such as we read by the poet Ulrich von Lichtenstein in his autobiography titled, In the Service of Ladies. Now in that particular text we read, and I quote, the pure sweet lady knows well how to laugh beautifully with her sparkling eyes. Therefore, I wear the crown of lofty joys as her eyes become full of dew from the ground of her pure heart. With her laughing, immediately I am wounded by many." Unquote. Clothing, too, was always used to enhance sexuality. However, fashions didn't change much over the course of millennia, and their sexual utility was not fully realized. The beginnings of frequent change in clothing styles, along with recognition of their multitude of ways of enhancing sexuality, began in Europe at a time that has been reliably dated by fashion historians James Laver and Ferdinand Braudel to the middle of the 14th century, a period when sexualized items like lingerie and corsets began to rise to fame. As mentioned earlier, the most powerful of romantic love's tricks was the tantalizing of men with a promise of attachment, a goal that would remain largely out of reach. Stories of the troubadours attest to a hope-filled agony that plagued the male lover, with men dwelling in a strange kind of purgatory in waiting for a few solaces from the beloved. The medieval love game went into full swing when codes of romantic conduct encouraged a toying with the two extremes of acceptance and rejection. Compare the list of dating rules I mentioned earlier with the following list from The Art of Courtly Love, a love manual widely disseminated in the 12th century. And I'm quoting here, Love is a certain inborn suffering. Love cannot exist in the individual who cannot be jealous. Love constantly waxes and wanes. The value of love is commensurate with its difficulty of attainment. Apprehension is the constant companion of true love. 
Suspicion of the beloved generates jealousy and therefore intensifies love. Eating and sleeping diminish greatly when one is aggravated by love. The lover is always in fear that his love may not gain its desire. The greater the difficulty in exchanging solaces and the more the desire for them, the more the love increases. Too many opportunities for seeing each other and talking will decrease love. Shakespeare's most romantic of plays tells the same story with Juliet keeping her lover midway between coming and going, between stable pair bonding and the single life. Here Juliet tells her obedient lover, "'Tis almost morning, I would have thee gone, and yet no further than a wanton's bird that lets it hop a little from his hand." like a poor prisoner in his twisted gyves, and with silken thread plucks it back again, so loving jealous of his liberty. To which Romeo replies in accord with the expectations of romantic love, I would I were thy bird. Following this little detour into history, we now come to a final juncture of this talk and where we ask Aristotle's million-dollar question, that for the sake of which, to what end are these superstimuli employed? Many would offer the cliched answer that such practices garner reproductive success, that the woman employing them gains a quality mate and produces offspring to perpetuate the species. But this explanation is too simple. For starters, there are other aims of human life than reproduction, such as garnering of food, securing wealth, attachment needs, or of securing narcissistic gratification for a woman who may never intend to have offspring. The resources garnered via her carefully orchestrated superstimuli can serve other ends. Moreover, it appears not to have entered the minds of the reproduction enthusiasts that such strategies may, in fact, be deleterious to reproduction. All one has to do is look at failing relationships everywhere, lowering birth rates, and decaying societies in the West that do not portend a future of success riding on the back of the super stimuli we've grown so fond of exploiting. Narcissistic gratification is certainly one motive we've underemphasized in our focus on reproduction, though it too is not the final motive. There can be nothing more gratifying to the narcissistic impulse than to wield power, as do most women, and to this end, super stimuli places immense power in their hands. Narcissistic indulgence may well be a heavily socialized trait in modern women, but it also proves to be a short-term windfall with not so gainly long-term results. Evidence shows that the misery index for women has risen sharply in the age where they have it all. To summarize all that we've said, the extreme gynocentrism we live with today is a freak, a Frankenstein that on some level should not be, or at least should not be any more than the supersized cuckoo chick that swells in the nest of a tiny finch. It's an event that our systems were not specifically designed for, yet we remain caught in the insoluble loop of desire that keeps it going. We might think of it as a propaganda campaign every bit as strong as those used during the world wars to target our territorial reflexes, only this campaign has been in continual use and refinement for the last 900 years. Whatever gynocentric impulse lies buried in our nervous system, it has now been supersized, and we continue to supersize it with ever more refinements of superstimuli. But if we regain our awareness, we might, just might, kick this cuckoo's egg out of our biological nest. That can begin by recognizing that we've been hypnotized and deciding that we no longer wish to indulge it. 
It's as simple as choosing not to chase the dragon, but to slay it. Hi guys, time for this week's Thursday tip. That tip is to learn your history. I know, history is a boring ass subject for a lot of people. But stop and consider for a moment that the history we talk about here is the history of you. It is the pieces of the puzzle that explains how you arrived in the world you live in full of white knights, groveling sycophants, and so many women who can't tell the difference between themselves and a Disney princess. If you understand romantic chivalry, then you understand a huge component of modern feminism, modern traditionalism, and modern female entitlement. For those of you interested in anti-feminism, MGTOW, or men's rights, it gives you a context for seeing and understanding what you're up against and why. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation today. You can help us keep this up by subbing to the channel, liking and sharing the video. Very importantly, you can help us out by visiting the Patreon page and making a small pledge for the videos produced here. Thanks, and see you next time.